This podcast contains factual information only. It is intended for professional financial advisors and does not contain any personal financial advice. You should not make any investment, insurance or financial decisions based on the content of this podcast. Hey team, Ben Nash here. I'm one of the co-founders at XY Advisor and founder of the rapidly growing Pivot Wealth, which is my business baby. I started from scratch about eight years ago and I've since scaled up to become one of Australia's better known financial advice companies for high income accumulators. You can join me every Tuesday as I have the pleasure of furthering my own knowledge by interviewing some of the best people in our industry and beyond to improve every part of what we do with our advice process. We're currently hiring financial advisors and associates, so if our approach resonates, you can learn more at pivotwealth.com.au forward slash careers. PlutoSoft is a comprehensive financial planning software and CRM program. It covers every part of the advice process, fact-finding, strategy modeling, portfolio management, life insurance, SOA, and report generation. Plus, it includes workflow management and a client hub portal. PlutoSoft helps financial planning firms produce high-quality advice in a fraction of the time and has an extensive range of platform data feeds. As the industry's complete all-in-one solution, PlutoSoft has helped rocket fuel the success of leading financial planning firms around Australia. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the XY Advisor team and I'm pumped to be here today with the one and only Mr. Liam Short. Um, Liam is uh, huge in the XY community if you've been hiding under a rock, but um, he is director, he's an SMSF specialist advisor um, at Verante. Uh, yeah, keen to pick Liam's brain and the, the evolution of his business and some of the lessons learned along the way. Liam, thanks for joining us, mate. Great to join you. Mate, I'm, uh, yeah, it's an interesting background and some of the stories which we'll no doubt um, cover, but I thought maybe a, a, a good place to start would be just the, um, I suppose, the how you kicked off your business and, you know, how you've ended up where you are today. Yeah, well, look, I, I married an Aussie nurse in the Middle East in Saudi Arabia, um, came back here for six months in 2001 and never left. So basically, I had to start off from scratch again. So got a job in a accounting and financial planning firm. I was originally meant to do a bit of marketing for them. But the week I started, the uh, power planner fell in love and left the business. So I stepped <laughs> in and <laughs> I knew I was going to have to do the exams and everything anyway, so that power planning was a great way to learn it. So first few years, just power planning, learning, soaking everything I cut up. Um, and because it was a mixed financial planning and accounting firm, and a lot of it revolved around um, the use of SMSFs and retirement planning. So yeah, the, the first few years were uh, all, all learning and then hit a bit of a hurdle in 2005 when I had a problem with my, my boss and ended up being a bit of a whistleblower. Um, because we were looking to merge a number of firms at the time and the, in the due diligence, uh, uh, an issue came up that um, we couldn't ignore. So I basically talked myself out of a job at that stage and had to, to restart. But as part of the what happened with that, I ended up having to go out and see every client. Um, did 65,000 kilometers that year. Uh, and it, uh, from there, I got my own license and, and started building a business. Um, I really started looking at, you know, what people were looking for in advice. And in the areas I, I lived and worked, it was very much a case of pre-retirement planning and, and retirement planning. And, uh, you know, I was because I was starting practically from scratch, I had to figure out ways to, to get in front of accountants and get in front of mm. clients. So, yeah. yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, because you were giving me a bit of the backstory on this um, b before we fired up the camera and, um, the, you know, the uh, without going into all of the detail, there were a few clients who got really badly burned. So essentially you sent out to assure, you know, all of the other clients that everything was fine and that their money was safe and um, everything that was there and essentially give them the, you know, make, make sure that they've got that peace of mind, but then give them the option of finding another financial planner and 65,000 kilometers later and all of those client conversations that essentially so many of the clients wanted to stay with you looking after them that you're 
licensee told you to set up your own business essentially mm -hmm. so yeah. that's uh i'd say that i fell into um being a business owner but if there's a story about how that's <laughs> happened that's um it was one of the most interesting ones i've ever heard yeah so and, and look it, it it was a great learning curve and it did teach me that because i'd had interaction with those clients over two or three years it's amazing how much trust one i learned that trust can be abused but two, I learned how much, even just over the phone with people and dealing with them via email, you do build up a lot of trust over the years. So, mm. and it, and it, you know, it is a real asset if you can if you can work with that um, to get further referrals and uh, and work on your work on your business from there. Um, you know, when it came to about two thousand and eight, I was I was I would say I was struggling. I was working in partnership with a, a local accounting firm down here in Castle Hill. I was getting some business from them, fairly good. It was coming through, but I really need to step up if I wanted to survive in the in the industry. So I was sitting down with a gentleman called Colin Williams, um, who's been in the industry for a long time, and he said, "You need to find a niche." He said, "If you know, in the the area you're working in, why don't you look at the SMSF space?" Um, got totally blown away by what he was talking about. Went home that night, bought the Twitter handle, um, bought the website yeah. smsfcoach.com.au.com basically yeah you know, everything i could do about it got it together set up a wordpress press blog and really realized that there was a lot of technical information out there for smsf and retirement planning but mm. nobody nobody was breaking it down into plain english so i just started doing a blog once a week and um, just taking technical articles taking out all the, the legislation and all the the jargon and just breaking it down into plain english for people um, I started that about 2009, 2010, and for the first few years, it was it, it was really going nowhere. But it was getting me a bit of attention. Um, yeah. I was get, I was being asked for comments by you know the, the the papers. I was getting it on Sky News Business Channel, so it was it was creating a regular uh, stream of publicity. And now I look at my blog, and I've got about there's about 256 entries on there. I haven't done a blog in 10 months. And yet, mm. I'm still getting I'm still getting such a flow of business through from it. So it it really is a case of if you're trying to build a niche, try and build a collateral that you don't have to keep on doing new stuff all the time. If it's good advice, it's going to last longer term. So mm. try and try and not just tie your down to, yourself down to specific dates, um, and and just you know, build that collateral over time so that if you can, it does the work for you rather than you having to chase it all the time. Yeah, absolutely. I was actually just chatting to this company that we're doing a bit of a content partnership with at the moment. And um, I, somewhat similar to you, when I, I started uh, Pivot in 2015, and at that time, I'd like I'd never written a blog before. I was like, oh, you know, I'll give this a go. And I did a blog weekly for a while. And, you know, as these things go, like similar to you, started getting some results, build a bit of momentum. One thing leads to another thing. But I, like you, have not done a – well, I've, I've done a few blogs which I've used as our sales and marketing collateral and then put them as, as blogs. But I haven't consistently blogged for a number of years. But in doing this content partnership, they said, have you got anything around these particular topics? And I went back down through the archives and I found that there was there was like half a dozen articles that were the same, exactly the same. It's like, you know, how to make it easy to save more money, how to build another income investing, like these things that do sort of last forever. But I think one of the things that you touched on there is really consistency is key. And there's so many things when it comes to marketing that you can do. And I've definitely fallen into this trap before as well that you can do you know every social channel at the same time and you can do paid advertising and you can do online courses and webinars and all of these things but you generally can't do them all unless you've got a, a business that's got a whole marketing team in it um, and where people go wrong I think and where I've gone wrong in the past is you play at the surface level and then you it's not working and it takes a lot of time and you're like stuff this like it's 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 not worth the bang for buck and then you stop and you don't see it to get results sort of like what happens with our clients that if they yeah. get too caught up on strategies and aren't consistent that they're not going to get the results um either but interesting you from what you were saying there around the the fact that you targeted the niche to target your referral partners i've never actually come across that before i feel like that's a really novel 
idea it makes a lot of sense but you go okay well accountants need to need an smsf solution and they they're going to be open to that conversation so if you've got an ideal referral partner why not put your niche um yeah. beside them that's great well the, the big concern i had was accountants just didn't trust financial planners so i just mm. couldn't you know i i couldn't build a business because I, could, I couldn't get the referrals but then when i started writing the blogs after a year or two i found out that it was the staff in the accounting firms were looking, were Googling for solutions for the clients. <laughs> they would find my blog. And, you know, for example, one of the, the best blogs I've ever done is just the stamp duty concessions in each state for moving a property into a self-managed super fund. Okay. I, I do very little property, but nobody could find that information. I got a lawyer to just check it all, make sure I was correct. And yeah. that blog constantly gets about 20,000 hits a year. Um, yeah. So I was just finding that the the juniors in the accounting firms were saying to their bosses, "Look, the client needs to do this. You need they need to get advice. You know, do they have a planner? No, they don't. This guy's written a, an article explains all how to do it. Maybe we should just send them to them." And then so yeah. I was getting I was getting asked to come into the accounting firm instead of knocking on the door and saying, "Can I come in and have a chat with you?" In most cases, they were saying no. Mm. Finally, I was being asked to come in and actually speak to their staff and speak to their clients. I but, love it. You know, the main reason I, I targeted the niche was I found there was a lot of people wanted to know about retirement planning and SMSFs were the flavor of the day. But very quickly, I realized that only about two or three out of 10 needed an SMSF. Yeah. But every client that came in asking about one was engaged. They wanted to manage that. They wanted to put money away for retirement. They wanted to put more into super. They oh. wanted to, they wanted a bit more control. So it was a case of they came in, I analyzed what they, they needed, saw, thought of an, an SMSF was required. If it wasn't, we had other solutions. So either mm. a retail fund or an industry fund. And sometimes saying no to somebody is such a great way of building trust because I would say to them, look, you don't need an SMSF for what you want to achieve. So here are some other solutions, and this is how much it'll save you by going down that route rather than taking on the risk yourself of trying to pick investments. And it worked. And the, and the admin, and even if you've got an admin provider, it's still a laborious exercise for sure. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people, though, are, are, are fearful in niching that they're going to be cutting themselves out to you know the, the broader market if they do pick a niche. What's your been your experience with that, Liam? Uh, look, uh, I have all sorts of clients. So purely, I just want anybody who's engaged and wants to, to, to be involved in their planning. And for me, that it worked by, by choosing that niche. Most of my clients um, don't know anything about the SMSF coach because they've been <laughs> referred on from another client who we've done. They may have an SMSF, but they're just, you know, their friends want some retirement planning. They come in and... Yes. They, if they, if I don't see any need for an SMSF, I'm not even mentioning it to them. So it's mm. it's just purely you. You've got to have something to get them in the door, um, and then it's a, a case of finding. You, you know, we all have to act in best interests. So if I don't think a client is right for for an SMSF, I don't put them in there. I've never actually. I don't think I've ever actually suggested a client go into an SMSF. Most of them have come and asked, should they? And I've decided, mm. and I've made a recommendation, yes or no. Yeah, amazing. Uh, but I think it makes sense that that a lot of people don't understand a lot of advice consumers or you know just general sort of finance um, uh, people like just general people they don't understand what an SMSF means and they they're drawn to an SMSF because they feel like it gives them control. But these days you can get all that control with you know with with other solutions. So yeah, um, it it makes sense that they've obviously got an interest to get them in and start the conversation and it might be start with what they want or what they think they want, but then you can uncover what they need and deliver to that. Liam, what's, what have been the biggest shifts in your business? So you've been at it for quite a while. What have been the biggest changes that you've made over that time? Um, look, I would say originally, like most young planners, I, I thought it was an investment guru to start with. And I, I quickly realized over time that, you know, the, the index does very well. Um, industry funds do very well. So I stopped trying to be the investment guru. And from probably 2011 onwards, I concentrated on strategy. Um, every time I'm talking to clients, it's, look, I will start with the strategy. We'll eventually get to the investments. Um, but, you know, 
people, most people think of a financial planner, it's just doing investing. So if you mm. can turn that conversation around and show them how much added value you can do, um, you know, on the strategy side, I had clients in this morning who they're just retiring and we're doing the downsizer contribution, withdrawal and recontribution strategies. They've sold a property. So we're doing carry forward concessional contributions to, to offset tax. And, you know, at the very end of it, I said, you know, I'm going, oh, by the way, here's where the investments are going to be put. And so we've done an hour yeah. on, on strategy and five minutes on where the investments were going. Yeah, well, I think increasingly that um, it's that is the main focus. And I think, you know, who knows what the future looks like. But I, I also love the index. I think even for non people that don't want to follow that sort of approach, though, that in the future, it's likely that tech is going to be a big part of investment choices for people and it's sort of what does that leave for financial planners it's exactly it's exactly that it's the strategy it's the coaching the guidance the support the you know giving people confidence to take action so um i think if you don't have that in your in your repertoire that you you're potentially going to need to build the muscle at some point and look one of the things i realized probably after four or five years as an advisor was that people don't have the confidence to retire so you've got to put them in a position where they control that that decision. So mm. I, I get a lot of people coming in around 55 and they say, oh, we're going to have to work till we're 67 or 70. I look at their situation. I'm going, they've, they've saved really hard. They've put themselves in a really good position. If we do this properly, you know, I, I say, look, let's look at 62. I think we can do that as a realistic strategy and we might do a stretch goal of 60. How does that sound? And it, yeah, they just go, but how, you know, how? And, they're always thinking of their take home pay. So they may be on a big salary, but if they're, you know, if they're on 200,000, they're losing 35% of that in, um, in tax. Yeah. They, they don't realize that if they're structured properly in retirement, you know, there's no tax. We can, mm. you know, we can have tax free pensions plus some assets outside that end up being tax free as well. Um, and that, that really, you know, once you show the sustainability of a decent retirement income based on what they have, they are now in control of that decision to retire. And more and more, you know, I used to always be working on retire at 65, 67, but nearly every client now I'm stretching them. I'm going, come on, let's, you, you, do you really want to be working at that age? Yeah. Or, or do you want to have a choice whether you work at that age? Mm. Mm. And uh, so nearly, you know, with most clients now, it's a, it's a real stretch goal to, to, to be in charge of the decision around 60, 62. And that's, that's probably the biggest change. I love it. I, and I think it, it's how much is that confidence worth? Um, uh, it, you know, it pays for itself just in itself, but obviously, you know, there's the dollars that sit behind it as well. Liam, what are the things that haven't changed in your business over the time that you've been going? Uh, paperwork. <laughs> um, <it's>, <laughs> compliance, it's, it's just got more and more. Um, uh, you know, f uh, I just think over the last, few years it's got ridiculous and um, the amount of pages i'm putting in front of clients now for you know fixed term service agreement a fee form for each of their their superannuations and their pensions it's just you know a, authority to access information and then you've got each of the industry funds and retail funds have got it got their own version of forms to do yeah mm. this most of what we do is 90 percent the same with every every fund and every fund manager and every you know every insurance company we deal with yet they all feel that they need to have different types of forms mm. and they I just think don't... sometimes that it's a barrier that they put there on purpose because it's like it's it slows down access or i don't really know what the strategy is around that because yeah. ultimately if someone's going to change they're going to change but maybe there's enough people that just get jack of of having to jump through all the hoops and give up that uh, makes it worthwhile yeah but from a client's point of view they only see it once a year so if it was a standard form they could they could trust and they understood you know that there, there was little no chance of fraud you know if if there was one form that was used by the industry mm. it would be much and from their point of view it would be much safer but um mm. yeah so that's one of my bugbears and, and you know in the smsf space it's all the different trustees yeah. you know 99 percent of people could use the exact same trustee yet everybody's out there spruiking their own versions of it mm. um for something that most clients will never even read but mm, totally. as an advisor, I've got to read them. <laughs> so it's a major pain. <laughs> <laughs>
Liam, what's the what do you see as the key drivers of your of the growth of your business? Look, one, I've built up built up the brand, I've built the, the reputation. Now we've got we've got the flow of business coming in. At the moment we're in you know stagnating because we just can't find good planners. Um you know, so I I could probably double the business easily if we had you know good planners on board. There's so many people need advice now. Yeah, there's a yeah. huge cohort in that 60 to 65 age group. And now I'm, you know, my 80 to 85 year old clients, their children are coming to 55, 60. And they, mm. want, to tra- they want to ensure that there's a transfer of wealth to them that works smoothly. So um, I think the big thing over the next, you know, 10 to 30 years is intergenerational wealth transfer and getting that right. Um, and I just see so many advisors that don't even ask uh, details about the children you know they get the names or the ages and that's it um it's important to understand who's going to be the decision maker when your client can't handle it for themselves um mm. you know i had one case where you know when i was younger I, I didn't ask that question the father passed away we delivered really steady returns and good exactly what the the, the parents wanted um but once the son became involved to help the mother he decided to become a day trader with their money. No, oh, no. Um, you know, so he didn't want me involved at all. That was fine. But she came back five years later and, you know, half the wealth had disappeared. So, oh. you know, if I'd been involved in the conversation earlier on, then we could have, you know, engaged with the son, made him understand what the parents had been trying to achieve each year because they wanted income. Um he was, you know, a younger generation who just wanted to make as much money as possible. But, mm. you know, with that extra risk comes the risk of loss as well. And that's what happened. And how are you practically doing that? Like, how are you, how are you tackling that with your clients, with new clients, with the clients that you've been working with for a while? Very much true the estate, the estate planning to start with. Um, who, you know, really work with the clients on who's going to be their enduring power of attorney and their enduring guardian. Um, and then, the minute we we start really having to plan, we say, look, bring them along for a meeting. Or we also offer that if they need advice themselves, we're happy to to have an initial meeting and see if we can help without you know sort of being fully engaged. But now I'm, I'm having that second generation are becoming clients. So it, you know, I not only will I be taking over the parents, you know, taking care of the parents, I'm taking care of their children and the the inheritance that's going to come to the children as well. Um, and once you get one of them in the door, more than likely the, the other kids are going to come on board as well when the inheritance comes because everyone yeah. just wants a solution. Yeah, totally. Um, we sort of go a little bit the other way in that most of our clients are like 35 to 45 and they're one of their, because our clients are pretty generally, um, you know, pretty solid levels of wealth that their big concerns is making sure the parents are are provided for. So it's almost like, that there's that it goes both ways but there is that bigger concern for people that are doing sort of okay that it's like let's make sure that they're doing really well so that that it doesn't become um something that's consuming their resources at the wrong time obviously they want to help each other but making sure that it's set for that um but how do you I've, i've sort of struggled with that in you know just the different engagements obviously i suppose it's a bit different if you're going from 80 to 50 because a lot of your clients are in across those brackets but i found that going the other way it can be going from 30 to 60 or 70 that it it is a little bit of a barrier in terms of the conversation are there any sort of hacks or lessons that you've learned there and how to drive engagement for someone that's peripheral but not necessarily you know drinking the kool-aid yeah look we find you don't push it you see, you, you just make make them aware you're there. Um, mm. We've got a financial knowledge center, which is you know provided by Iris that we 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 provide free to our, our clients, and it's you know it's got a database of articles on tax, estate planning, superannuation, everything like that. So we'd, often we'll, we'll we'll get the question, you know, um, we've got a, a son who's 30, he wants to start up a new super fund. Where should he go? I'll just say get him to come in. We'll do a, a small statement of advice. Um, we'll, you know, it's normally discounted based on the, the parents' needs. Um, and with the younger clients, what we do to them is say, look, you need to know what your parents have in place because if they don't have an enduring power of attorney and you have to 
to step in at some stage, you're going to have to go mm. to the, the tribunal to get, you know, help them out. And I, I had a client during COVID that got stuck down in uh, Victoria for nearly two months because they had to go to the, the Victorian tribunal to get, con- to be able to control the assets of the parent. Okay. Um, and it, you know, he was trying to run a business at the same time. Mm. So it's very, you know, it's not just the parents need to have stuff in, in place, but the kids need to know that that's in place so that their time isn't uh, messed up in the future as well. So, but with, with a lot, it's just don't push it, make sure you're available if they need it, even if it's for just a bit of general advice um, and just constantly tell the parents to, you know, make sure your children know who they need to come to if something goes wrong. Mm. Do you find that they use the, the they use those articles, the learning center or your content? Not not a lot, but okay. the whole idea is that they're getting the newsletter once a month, so it's it's a trigger point. And and what I do find is maybe after six months, someone will contact us and say, look, and, and we've seen a lot in the last year where because of that my super ratings thing, you know, where yes. some of the super funds did really poorly, we suddenly had people going, look, I've been with one of these underperforming funds for 15 years mm. i think we've got enough in there now that mom and dad have used you i think we need to come and see you and actually you know sort ourselves out because it's a large pot of money that we'd ignored up to now but when suddenly 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 somebody tells you it's not performing then mm. you take notice totally and it's just that constant tap on the shoulder as well that knowing that you're there i think uh I make the analogy that like people get a bit they see something they're like, oh yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Yeah, I should do that. And then they don't do anything. And then it's like when it, the next time that it happens, it's like, oh shit, I still haven't done anything about that or um, it's still there. And then ultimately like it's, you know, like, it's easy for life to get in the way, but then they just make that decision. And um, and, and if you're, happens. if you're top of mind, they'll reach out to you. Mm. Yeah. Um, and look, uh, everyone's busy. And it, I've, I only realized that, you know, six years ago, seven years ago, that my clients, most of them had never had another planner. So they didn't refer because they didn't know if I was a good planner or not. Yeah. You know, they, they had confidence in me, but they didn't have the confidence to tell somebody else that they should come to me. So, you know, again, someone said, well, look, go into some of the awards, try and get some awards because it, it gives yeah. your clients a, a, an anchor on which to, to refer you. And yes. So I, I did that around 2017, 18. I went into the SMSF awards and won a, won a couple of awards. Did the, you know, I, I did the, um, the Financial Standards Power 50 every year. I made sure I was in there. And it doesn't take much. So now I've got clients who don't have SMSFs, but the very fact that I've got an award for something they say well that means you must be fairly good at what you do and um they refer people to me so it's good yeah it's just that external validation i think to as a yardstick to measure against that even if they don't understand the ins and outs of it it's still in in itself that they go there i think that's why social media is so helpful as well that you're constantly there and it's like they're like oh that seems to make sense maybe that person's chonky or maybe they're a lunatic and then it's like you're still there and you're there next year and the year after and the year after that there's something in that because there's so and many that, people that come in and then they're gone that that idea of consistency as well like i, yeah. I love social media you know uh, know. you know it's my way it's my way of winding down but um <laughs> and that's you know that's how i a lot of the way i built my brand in the first place because i didn't know very many people and yes. um, I would just answer people's questions or if, if somebody was, uh, you know, in the newspaper and an article was tweeted and, the, you know, there was something in there that wasn't clear, I'd just make it clear in a tweet or a, a Facebook post. And eventually what would happen was the journalist would start calling me for the, for the answer and yeah. asking me what I thought was the solution. Um, and, it, you know, that's, once you do that consistently, you make friends with them and they reach out to you whenever they need help. And it's all momentum, I think, with that stuff. That's been my experience that you start doing something and then it leads to something, you know, something small and then you keep doing that and then it leads to something a little bit bigger and then the things just get get a little bit be- bigger, a little bit better, a little bit better for business, a little bit more of an opportunity, a little bit more profile and they feed on feed on each other. So, um, mate, it's, it's great to see. What's uh, what's coming up for you? What's uh, What's your focus? What's on the radar? Um, I've got a huge backlog. (laughs) So for me, um, I really need to get on top of that, hire one or two more planners and get get that up and running. Um, But 1st of July, for anybody involved in retirement 
planning is a major shift. So from the 1st of July, 2022, you know, your client's going to be able to put money into super as non-concessional up to 75 years of age without a work test. So there's going to be so many recontribution strategies, like a big opportunity to save on the debt benefits tax. So moving money from taxable component to tax-free component, that is huge. You know, the, the fact that we've got an extra 10 years or, or seven, you know, eight years to do that. Um, mm. You know, I saw the government coming out with the reducing the downsizer to, to 55. Well, you know, if you're 55, you can get 2.43 million in to super before 75 just using the non-concessionals. You don't need the downsizer unless you're very rich. Um, yeah. So, you know, uh, it, it's a case, uh, again, it comes back to concentrate on the strategies, the, the areas where you can add value to clients. And that's more and more where I'm focusing is just trying to make sure that we're not just looking at how to set them up for retirement or how to fund the income in retirement, but now looking for what happens afterwards when they do pass away, um, especially with the limits on, on what can be in pension phase, whether or not, you know, when the first person passes away, whether does all the money go to the spouse or do we start um, getting it out to the the next generation at that stage. So there's there's more use of uh, insurance bonds, more in use of trusts, um, and you know my clients are not multi multi millionaires. I mm. you know I work in Castle Hill and the Hawkesbury in in North West Sydney. They're just mm. mum and dads. Um, but the wealth that most mum and dads have built up now is is fairly substantial. And they want to make sure it goes properly to the next generation, as they should. And uh, you know, it's not, uh, yeah, it's, it's not easy going with that stuff. And I think, um, yeah, it's great to see all the, the the strategic opportunities that are out there. I think uh, that's one of the things that I love about being a planner is that there's always something more to learn, and then they change, you know, everything or almost everything, mm. and you know, it creates a new set of things that are there. But you, you look at something like the carry forward concessional contributions. You know, I picked up a few clients in the last few months who'd sold properties. They never, they have bugger all super. And then I suddenly said, look, you've got a $300,000 capital gain. You haven't put any money into super in five years. Um, I can get 100000 of of that capital gain reduced to 15% tax. And it, it just blows their mind that they didn't know about these things. Mm. Um, and suddenly, you know, you've got somebody who's a property investor, not interested in financial planning, and suddenly they, they get awakened to what the, you know the opportunities that are available, and you've got a yeah. client for life. Totally, and I think, like you were saying uh, early on, it's like you get them in with what they what they want or what they think they want, and then you give them what what they need. It's great to mm. see. Um, Liam, my last question for you is that if you could go um, back to, you know, day one of your business, uh, the, you're about to, you know, put out the shingle, what would be the, the one piece of advice that you would give yourself? That, that you have to build up a profile. Um, you know, there are so many advisors out there that you have to differentiate yourself from, from the rest or you have to target an issue. You, you can't be a master of everything. You know, I tried to be a mortgage broker early on. And, um, you know, I, I thought of, I have a degree in accounting and economics, so I thought I might do the accounting work. I very clearly understood and probably learned from the SMSF space that you're better off working as a team with other professionals mm. and try and do that early on. Yeah, if, if I had known one thing, it would have been to, to be reaching out and building relationships much earlier on and being build trusting relationships not revolving around how much each is going to you know pay you in you know commissions or fees but what the value you can add to each other's businesses um i did some of the the estate planning i see is cruel you know where lawyers have just written a you know mom and dad will not taking into consideration disabled children or uh, children in businesses or in bad relationships and when when you step in there and, and say look you need to go to a, a, a lawyer who's really going to take care of you and understand your needs you, know, you get nothing from it but the client that you know the trust that you build with that client and that you transfer to that you know that solicitor is huge and that comes back over time totally and i think that that's what allows you as well to be you be the expert in your lane you you need you need people that are experts in there so that the clients are still getting that um, whole view but i think the days of being all things to all people is hard and almost the days of fully integrated businesses there there's a lot of commerciality in it but 
um, uh, from a client perspective and also from a business perspective, it's hard to do that in a sustainable, efficient and profitable way. So. And to meet, it's difficult to meet best interests. Um, you know, if you're, if you're trying to just put everybody in one, um, you know, one hole, fit them all into the one, oh. one area. Um, you know, I've got accountants and administrators that you, different ones suit different people on the SMSF space. I've got lawyers who do a lot of your know, complex estate planning, simple estate planning. Um, they're in different parts of the, the country. Some mm. that are online and, you know, the clients never meet them. But um, yeah. you, just, you have to have that variety. If you, if you try and just pigeonhole everybody, you, you're going to do yourself and them as a service long term. And it's hard also hard to stand out from the crowd, like you say, with a niche if you're trying to be all things to all people as well. Yeah. So, I um, made definitely some wise words there. But thank you so much for, for sharing your insights. It's uh, yeah, gr- great to watch you continue to kick goals as well. So, I uh, really appreciate your time. And, uh, yeah, looking forward to the next conversation. Thank you very much. It was great.